Fire Police Emergency. My brother's just been shot. OK, what's his name? Michael Rainsford. He's been shot in the house? Yes, yes, Chris, please. Who's he been shot by? We don't know. Michael, hey, Mike, wake up for me. What's your name? My name is Josh. I'm his brother, I'm his, I'm his younger brother. We don't even know if we're safe. We don't know if we're safe All to right. be here right now. Are you in the house, are you? Mike? Michael? Michael? Josh? 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 A murder inquiry is underway after a 20-year-old man was shot dead on Merseyside. Police were called to Harrington Road in Litherland shortly after 11 o'clock last night. The victim was taken to hospital but pronounced dead a short time later. We were just going about that night. Me and my dad sat there on the couch watching telly. My team came in about 11 o'clock. I was just getting ready for bed, almost falling asleep. She comes in and he goes, you're all right, Dad. Would you be able to take me to my girlfriend's, please? She says, hey, what are you up, son? It's getting late. I want to go to bed. So we went in the kitchen and then he started to fill his bag with uh, what he always does. Biscuits, crisps, you know, drinks, stuff for them to have a picnic, you know. My dad stood up uh, to go out into the kitchen and I've, I've followed behind. And I walked into the kitchen and I got through the door for him and I said, uh, will you hurry up, Michael, and wait to go to bed? And I never finished that sentence. The loudest bangs I've I've ever heard. And you you've gone from half asleep, you know, to it being in the war zone. Michael ran across me, startled, probably not knowing what had happened. And we just um, we got into the hall, and uh, we were just trying to be somewhere where there was no windows. And um, I thought everything was OK, cos obviously I'm like, he's running. Um, so first thing I do, as soon as I see that, there's holes in the windows, I get a phone. I get straight on the phone to my man now. Me and Michael have got hold of each other, just huddling, you know, and then he said, Dad, and then he slumped. He just fell backwards and kind of like just slouched down the wall. And that's when we realised he'd been shot. All right, what injuries has he got? Where's he been shot? Where's he been shot? He's dozing off, he's been shot in the side. All Please. right, it's okay. They told us to check for lift his shirt up. And we could see one hole in his chest and one hole in his back. Uh, and I, I, I lost, I lost the plot then. Dad, stop standing there, get pressure okay. on the wheel. I grabbed a cloth to try and um, cover his uh, gunshot wounds. Um, that wasn't effective though. I had the 999 on, on the phone, on the speaker, um, shouting down the phone, uh, telling me what to do. But because of the commotion and what was going on, um, hearing my brother uh, trying to breathe and my dad screaming and me crying. Uh, it, it was a lot to take in at the moment, so we were just doing what we could. Yeah, yeah no, no, that's the exit wound. Where's the entrance wound? He's, he, he, he's being shot. And I started to give Michael chest compressions. And uh, he just uh, made this noise. And it was like a roar. I 
of um, somebody that didn't want to die. And I looked at him, he was terrified. He was terrified. There was nothing I could do about it. And then the... the colour just drained from him. He just died in front of me. It's just I rolled back in his head and his colour went and he just died right in front of me. My house was now full of armed police officers, uh, guns and rifles. Um, they just um, asked me if I knew what had gone on. I just couldn't even speak. I didn't know what had gone on. And we were escorted from our house. We were told that it was now a crime scene and we weren't able to retrieve any of our personal belongings or anything like that. We were just told, if you've got somewhere to stay, you're just going to have to go there now. And we left the property. And there was ambulances, police cars down this little quiet street, all with the blue lights flashing. But not a sound. A 20-year-old man was shot dead on Merseyside. Talented skateboarder Michael Rainsford was hit by two bullets in his Litherland home. The victim was taken to hospital but pronounced dead a short time later. Everyone was really shocked, especially people living in that area. It could easily have been any of the sons or daughters. No one could comprehend why it was him. No one could comprehend. I first became aware of this murder probably about half five, six o'clock in the morning. I got a call from my senior officer. Upon attending the scene, the initial thought is that whosoever had carried out this attack meant to kill Mikey. Mikey was executed in his kitchen. The reason why I came to that conclusion was the spacings between the two shots. The shooter was actually tracking Mikey which meant that the first shot was discharged and when Mikey ran, the person would have had to physically change their direction, the point in the firearm, and shot at Mikey again. 20-year-old Michael Rainsford was shot dead in Liverland on Tuesday. Merseyside police are continuing to ask anyone... In a series of raids this morning, Merseyside police tried to track down some of those behind the violence. The fear for the public, though, is that these gangs clearly have no regard for their own lives, let alone these young children or anybody else on the streets of Merseyside. Michael's murder occurred in the Lillian Seaforth area of Sefton. Because of the area that it's taken place in and the firearm being used, you can't help but have one of your lines of inquiry being, is this a gang-related murder? Like a lot of places, you have the, the street gangs, the people that are involved in low-level drug dealing and things like that, but I think one thing that is the case on Merseyside is perhaps more of them have access to guns. I wanted to have a look in Mikey's room to see was there evidence of wealth? There were no large sums of money lying around. There were definitely no drugs and there were no guns. All in all, there was nothing to suggest he was involved in serious criminality. He was an innocent person, you know, and he wasn't involved in gangs. Yeah, and that's all I can say. Surprise for him. 
It was like cat and dog. It was your, your normal brother relationship. You love each other and you hate each other. No, what are you doing? <laughs> he was the glue to our family. I was proud. I looked up to him. He was my role model in life. Yeah, for everything, really. I am who I am today because of him. There's no one that can think of Mikey. Where was he? Everyone will say, Ramworth. I used to like watching other children, watching him, because he was the next level over these kids. He definitely had an ability, uh, maybe a lack of fear. Mikey at 13 was that far advanced. He was skating with us at 21 to 25. There's not a word for it. Prodigy. It's called me that. It's disheartening because you think about what he could be now, even a couple of years on. Yeah, there was potential, massive potential. I definitely reckon he could be up there with the big dogs and definitely represent England in the Olympics. Merseyside police say a man who was shot dead in Liverland on Tuesday was 20-year-old Michael Rainsford. Officers are continuing to ask anyone with dash cam or CCTV footage from Harrington Road to contact them. The police struggle to solve these crimes because there's a wall of silence, grass culture, I think they call it, or whatever. People are reluctant to come forward and give you information for fear that they will be dragged into those events themselves. As the SIO, I will speak to neighbours myself. The thing that stood out to me was a lot of them were fearful. A lot of them were shocked. We cannot resolve these problems on our own. We're desperately in need of our community's help. heartbroken when they found out it was him. I got loads of messages on my PlayStation from friends saying, is it, is it true? Is he, is, is he actually died? The social media side of things, and like with Snapchat and Instagram, I was waking up to 200 messages on Snapchat alone. Usually when it comes to things like this in our area, people don't talk. But when words go around that, that it's happened to Michael, literally everyone in the community was speaking out about everything they knew because they loved him. There was rumours floating around about certain things, you know, people putting up on Snapchat. I'd heard the nicknames. One was Wayne and one was Pip. That was within hours of the murder. That came through lots of people on social media. Just, you know, saying, it's, it's Pip, it's Pip. We didn't know who Pip was. My brother's just been shot. OK, what's his name? Michael Rainsford. He's been shot by? We don't know. People were telling us about communications that were on social media. We started getting names, and the two of the names that kept featured a lot 
were Pip and Worm. We needed to know who they were. Most investigations, uh, however serious they are, will often find policing turning to social media. People live their lives on social media, and it's the same for, for people that are involved in, in gangs. A big part of their psyche is trying to make themselves look credible, boost their own reputation, make themselves look stronger. What we've seen since September is an unprecedented rise in the number of shootings. The third fatal shooting in Liverpool in the last week. The gang's activities left the people who live here, and this is the word the police use, petrified. There's a lot of bravado there. Part of the bravado when it comes to, to gangland is the temptation to get himself involved with feuds, pick fights, try to look hard, try to build your credibility. As part of my role as crime reporter, I've covered quite a significant number of stories in the South Sefton area, which incorporates Seaforth, incorporates Liverland. It is an area where there have been pockets of gangland activity, and those involved in it have had quite a serious impact and influence on you know, the many, many innocent people living around them. We lived on Kirkstone, which is known to people as a gang area, but the part where we lived was kind of secluded from what was going on. Well, you're reading the echo that there's the name of this gang, but that's not something that you would say, oh, there's one there, or there's never anything like that. We were aware of these two separate factions, both concentrated around the south end of Sefton, which is only relatively small. One was known as the Kirkstone Riot Squad, KRS, and then you had the Linica Young Guns. The Linica Young Guns was more of an organised group. Sadly, what sat at the centre of some of these gang and gang violence was control of turf. Liverpool has had over the years a couple of cases that have resonated on a national and international level. We have chaotic, disenfranchised young men with access to firearms who just don't care about the consequence of them and just more than comfortable with using them to solve the most minor of disputes. As a result of that, innocent people are exposed to their crime and their you know, vindictiveness, and we see that time and time again. Reese had been shot in the neck and was dying in the car park, still in his football kit. A nine-year-old girl, Olivia Pratt Corbell, has lost her life, shot in her own home. Talented skateboarder Michael Rainsford was never in any trouble, says his heartbroken dad. The dad of tragic Michael Rainsford this evening spoke of his grief about the murder of his son four days ago. Most criminal offences are not committed with a firearm, so the killer is going to be further up in any level of criminality. You do lend yourself towards um, thinking that this probably is going to be a gang-related murder. We had witnesses gave us vital clues, one of which was the perpetrators, plural as in two, had arrived at the scene on an electric motorbike and that they had left on this electric motorbike. And we had a possible colour, which was either bronze or reddish colour. We knew that social media would be alive with this and that started to provide names for us. We started getting intel suggesting that Pip and Worm were brothers, namely James and Michael Foy. I'd never heard of the Foy's before now. Nope, never heard of them. I'd never heard of them, didn't know who they were. I just know that it was two kids, the Foy brothers. Don't really know the names, didn't really know any of the people and that, I just knew the areas that were sort of rife with the gangs and stuff and you just thought to either just nip through or just stay away. But you'd never sort of linger in them areas, just in case. 
Well, I was aware of the boys because three years earlier I'd sat in the Liverpool Crown Court with one of those brothers, with Michael Foy. You know, I was there for, you know, for the Echo covering it. You know, they had arrested and charged Michael Foy for drug dealing at the, you know, he was repeatedly caught dealing to undercover police. So he was already kind of on my radar, essentially, because I literally sat there, watched him get jailed. James is in his late teens. Michael is in his early 20s, associated to gang life and gang lifestyle. These were two boys that liked to ride off-road bikes, cause a lot of issues for the people that, that live nearby. They are individuals who we've arrested previously uh, for a multitude of offences. So we were aware of the foys. Uh, we were aware of their criminal activities. Was there something that Mikey had done to upset someone that we weren't aware of? On the night of the murder, the local PC was patrolling the area. Fortuitously, Constable Greer, a local police officer, was in that vicinity when she noticed two youngsters with what she thought was a scrambler bike. So her immediate thought was, well, that bike looks like trouble. You had loads of issues with scrambler bike causing disorder, criminality, etc. So she immediately put a call in for backup, and her idea was to basically cordon off that road and prevent the bike getting out. And while she was waiting for backup, the bike disappeared. PC Gray noticed the broken window, and this is the home address of Joyce Smith and the two sons. She spoke to Joyce, who explained to the officer that unknown person or persons had caused damage to the window. She remarked that one of the bricks had nearly hit her. Yeah, I'm just taking a statement from Joyce now. All the glass came flying through the blind. Yeah. And after they found the first brick in um, the behind two seater, yeah. by the, um, inside the living room, Sorry, the but obviously you said about the boys coming back. They might uh, have done. Well, you said to me before that they had. Come well, back. they hadn't come in. No, but they'd been back. They hadn't come in, yeah. Mm, they hadn't come in. So, how long after was it? Did you text the boys and tell them? Yeah. Yeah. What are your son's names? My son. Yeah. I know where they are, mate. But I have to obviously actually yeah. don't want to put words into your mouth. The officer asked about the two males who were on this bike, and she was told by Smith that, oh yes, it was her sons who were using the bike, namely James and Michael Foy. We knew that they would be made aware by their mum that her windows had been smashed. So it gave us a possible motive was the smashing of the window using a brick a precursor to this, particularly because the times of that were, were quite close together. Uh, the window was smashed at around quarter past 10 in the evening. Michael was murdered uh, within the hour. Clearly we're thinking, do the foyers know something that we don't, that it was Michael who'd smashed the window? Old Michael Rainsford was hit by two bullets in his Litherland home. Murder squad detectives are urging the public to contact them to help solve the tragic and violent crime. We're interested in finding the firearm. We want to get that dangerous weapon off the streets. But we also want to find the orange coloured Saron bike. As the investigation starts to gather the pace, we have key intelligence officers who are looking at social media posts. We were aware that Michael and James Foy had access to a number of electric bikes, one in particular, a sort of orangey bronze coloured electric bike. 
we conducted CCTV inquiries in the locality of where the boys lived. We were able to get evidence of them using said bike or similar bike over a period of time leading up to the murder. About two days after the murder, we had sufficient evidence to obtain a warrant which we executed at the home address of the Foy's. We searched that property and we did not find the gun. We did not find the bike. And coincidentally, all of them, so James, Michael and Joyce, their mother, just happened to lose their phones about the same time. The bike that was used has never been recovered. The gun that was used to kill Michael has never been recovered. Having no gun, having no witnesses, uh, does cause us a problem. Individual police forces try and do what they can. There have been a series of operations here in Merseyside against fire and... Police say the violence was fuelled by postcode tribalism. Unfortunately, it seems to be you can have a community of people where you've got 98, 99% of the community are all just getting on with their lives, and then there's this 1%, you know, that are involved in criminality. I don't think it was ever going up, it was a concern because my children weren't part of that world. Something happened which kind of put that my heat off living where we lived. I was downstairs one night just watching telly, cuddling with the dog, and I heard this really, really loud engine revving. Mikey was at a block of flats, just chilling with his friends as you normally would, and he was sat on, the, on a pedal bike, and this moped come onto the estate and bumped up onto the kerb. And he drove at the four of them. There's been two people on it, and the person on the back has had a machete in his hand. Everybody uh, ran into the flap up because my brother had a pedal bike. He's had to pedal off. Michael got on his bike and pedalled home, and he'd followed them. Now, Mike, he's managed to get into the front garden, through the bike, into the bushes, and he's jumped over the back gate and ran in. He actually heard them trying to um, kick the door through to try and get a hold of him. His face is pale white. He's, he's out of breath. He, you can tell that he's been shut up. He was just shouting, for the police, for the police. And all we could hear was a, a roaring of a motorbike engine outside the house. He looked out the window to see them with the bike on his shoulder, eh, on the back of the moped, and they've took the bike and, and left. And then we phoned the police, and they came out quite quickly to ask questions. We didn't know who it was. The two of them had balaclavas and they were wearing all black. It scared them. He was petrified, you know, as you rightly would be. Somebody coming after you with a machete, you know. Um, you know, he did indicate that he wanted to move after that. The Kirkstone Road north area of Litherland has been a flashpoint for crime and disorder over recent years, with locals complaining about a feared local gang called the Kirkstone Riot Squad. Mikey's grown up in an area you know, where there are lads at the same age as him that are involved in, in criminal activity. He might be nothing to do with them, but growing up in the same area, he'd go to the same school as them, you know, he'd be at the same community clubs, they'd have mutual friends. Never ever something you'd see Mikey involved in, but... It would be for something you've been accused of doing. It's as soon as your name comes out of someone's mouth, it's not just words anymore. It's it's hard to describe, but once someone says something about you and it gets about, it's it, the word spreads quick. It's Chinese whispers all, all around that area. <laughs> All I know is that he wanted to yeah, get away and just go somewhere safer, because he knew it wasn't safe. I 
I wish that's one of my many regrets is that I didn't act on it. But you know, we were, we just I just thought it was an isolated incident. If we look at any investigation, we'll start to try to build a timeline or a chronology of how the events took place um, and who was involved. And in our early stages, um, we obviously knew that at about quarter past 10 that evening on the 7th of April, that the foy's window had been smashed by somebody using a brick. Immediately after this window was smashed, Joyce had contacted her sons James and Michael Foy, who I categorised as suspects. Even though we haven't got the physical handsets, your phone will be leaving a history. It will be telling the mass which one it was talking to, when it was talking to, the movements of the phone. It's there, that's the footprint. We were able to get the expert to show us which phone mass James and Michael's phones we're tying to during the journey from Joyce's call and after the murder. Cell site data is absolutely fantastic, but it's not perfect. So cell site data won't put you directly on this road or in this house. It will give us an idea, the vicinity, the general direction of travel. You said about the boys coming back. They might um, have done. Well, you said to me before that they had come Well, back. they hadn't come in. No, but they'd been back, they hadn't come in, yeah. Mm. And they have a red, was it a red electric scooter, you said? Yeah. Electric bike. We know from Constable Greer's statement and some CCTV evidence that the bike travelled to the mum's address at the relevant time. And again, the CCTV showed the two figures on the bike leaving Rossini, the, the family seat of Foy brothers, Michael and James, and going towards Harrington Road, the location of Mikey's house. I would say it was almost like they were predators. They were hunting somebody. It's clear that that same bike was what was caught on the CCTV going to Mikey Rainsford address. Sadly, you could hear the gunshots on the CCTV. You could hear the two shots. After the murder, we were able to create a compilation of them taking the journey back home. Prosecuting any murder is often very, very challenging. I looked at the evidence, I think, have I missed anything? Although we had the cell site, although we had the CCTV, somebody could look at it and go, these are circumstantial. I knew those weren't just the evidence needed to prove. Michael Foy, who's 22, and James Foy, who's 19, are accused of killing 20-year-old Michael Rainsford, who was shot in his home in Litherland in April last year. I won't lie, I am always really nervous. It's my case. I am the SIO. The box stops with me. There was always a sense of jeopardy around the case because it was largely one that was based on circumstantial evidence. There is no murder weapon. There is no bike. So you, there's no... Nothing you can actually, you know, show to the jury. 20-year-old Michael Rainsford was shot dead in Leverland. Brothers Michael and James Foy deny killing him. Mikey's family were quite sombre, probably really nervous. 
It's not every day you walk into the Crown Court. It lasted for four weeks. It was very hard because this is all alien. The whole thing was alien, you know. I went through about half of the trial and um, it kind of got too much for me, so um, I stopped going. I just had my dad come home and tell me the updates. I went to all of the trial. That was traumatic, seeing those faces every day and just thinking they show no remorse. You sit there wondering, what's, what's the jury thinking? Because they, they sounded almost plausible. They denied having anything to do with Mikey's murder. They just denied everything. We've seen when people have been found not guilty uh, at trials and the impact that that then can have on a family. That was a key piece of evidence, um, that Snapchat information. We have done a number of warrants and arrests at various people's home addresses. We seized a, a, an individual's phone. A download of that recovered a Snapchat video. An account we believe were controlled by James Foy had posted this message and the picture that we knew were posted onto Snapchat was somebody sitting astride the orange Saron motorcycle, this electric bike, and they took a picture so you could see the key fob and you could see bits of the frame. There was only ever one orange bike. Every other bike was black. And that was a key. That was a key. What the person then wrote, tell your ma, duck, don't use bricks. And then there were two emojis. Bang, bang. Mikey was killed by two shots. By then, that is saying, you know what? You've thrown a brick through our house. This is what we're going to do. I could not believe that somebody would be so blasé to brag literally minutes before taking somebody's life and posting it on social media. But there it was. I think most users of Snapchat think that what they post gets automatically deleted after 24 hours. I think that's probably what James Foy thought. In this case, it wasn't on James' phone that the, the damning message was found. It was on somebody else's. By virtue of them deciding to reply to a message that James had sent, their phone had retained the image. The person posting the message, James, probably would not think in a month of Sundays that his mate would have had it on his device. But luckily for us, it was there. Michael and James Foy, who had gang links to Lineker Young Guns, were found guilty of gunning down the 20-year-old in his kitchen. The Snapchat message linked to James Foy's account was the most damning piece of evidence that the police had, and ultimately that was a crucial piece of, of evidence that, you know, helped convict the Foy's. Michael was sentenced to life imprisonment, 30 years, minimum 30 years to serve. And James, even though just 18, is sentenced to 28 years. It was a shard of relief. But it was, it wasn't, I knew that all through that trial, I wasn't gonna bring, that's the most important thing is Michael. And it's not gonna bring Michael back. It was as the verdict came back guilty and 
everybody were leaving the court and few of the defendants were shouting and trying to intimidate uh, members of the jury. You all started screaming and shouting and they showed the two colours then, you know, punching walls and threatening them, you know, making threats and things like that. I block it out, the stuff they were saying, because it was violent. She looked over at the family and Michael Foy said, I'll be out in 20 years, but Mikey will still be in the mud. My conclusion was Mikey had nothing to do with that window being smashed. He had categorically nothing to do with the broken window. He used uh, Michael's phone, so they were able to track him right through the day, right through the night. Um, and the last time they took a reading was in the mortuary at Aintree Hospital. That's where Michael's phone was in his pocket. It was half out of a castle, that's what it was. It was a lovely big back garden. Uh, we had lovely neighbours, a uh, lovely street. That's where we made a million memories, you know, from Halloween's, birthdays, Christmas, Easter, uh, trampolines, you know, you jump that high. We tried, we lived there for a few months. But we did get death threats through social media. And I think that was the tipping point. Yeah, you're gonna be in a dirt like your brother. Yeah, I'm gonna put holes in your chest and leave you in a box and stuff like that. But we had to take, we take the heaviest ever decision to leave. And we couldn't even tell the neighbours. We had to leave and not tell anybody, which was heartbreaking. We just left in the night. It's impossible to say why Mikey? We believe that in old friends of Michael's. We received a phone call from the Foy brothers asking for somebody's address on a cake stone because um, their window was bricked and this person gave our Michael's name in. We believe that, that is, um, that's the reason he was chosen. Um, somebody threw his name in the hat and he was chosen. I think that third party who knew both Mikey and had contact with the Foy's, that person would have known where Mikey resides. Um, that person would have known who Mikey hang around with. And I believe that person betrayed Mikey on the night by telling the Foy's where he lived. There's no justification, you know, at all. There's, you know, even through their warped gangster world, there's, there's no justification for what they've done. It's just evil visited our home that night and took away, you know, our lovely son. He was such an outgoing character. He was, uh, he was so bubbly, like, as soon as he'd smile, it'd just light up the room. He was known for his charm and smile. There was something about him, you know. He always had that little sparkle in his eyes. You, you, yeah, Dad, can you see me? I just want him to be remembered for, for the love and care and brother he was. I was very proud, very proud. Mm -hmm.